Well, good evening, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much. I desperately needed that right there. And the oh my, man, we love you guys, and I have experienced the presence of God more in the past 72 hours than I believe I have in the past six months. <clears throat> What God has taught us in the past six months, I'm going to talk about here tonight. If you would open your Bible to John 15 with me. We're going to start with verse 13. For those of you I don't know, I see a lot of unfamiliar faces to me in here, and that's awesome. Thank God. It's just... (laughs) My name's Kyle. This is my wife, Jamie. We moved to Colorado six months ago to help plant a church out there, and God has just taught us some amazing things over the past six months. So I want to share those things with you tonight. Let's start in John 15, verse 13. Just as a song that we just sang says, There is no greater love. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Now, I want to read a couple verses leading up to that so we can get the context. Go to verse 10. This is Jesus speaking. He says, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. (laughs) Praise God. He says, this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. God desperately loves you. Amen. Amen. God desperately wants you to be filled with his joy. Amen. You see, we get kind of a quiet, soft murmur when I say that. It's, it's nice, it's comfortable, it's churchy, right? But you see, here's the thing. The church in America is at great risk of, of becoming just another form of entertainment in our entain- entertainment-driven society. You see, our tendency is to come to church, to sit in the chairs and say, entertain me, preacher man. Give me a good message, preacher man. It it, it better be motivational. I skipped the football game to be here. So you better make this good. Entertain me. Make me a bicycle clown. (laughs) But you see, here's the thing. The church isn't another form of entertainment. Entertainment brings temporary happiness. The church is Christ's bride. And it is his great joy to bring you his church much joy, overflowing joy. Amen? Amen. And how does he do it? By serving you. By laying down his life for you. How does a husband bring great joy to his bride? By serving her, by laying down his life for her. But here's the question. Because we know that Christ is faithful to do his part. He's already done his part. So here's the question. How does the bride sustain that joy? How does the bride keep that joy, the joy of the Lord that he desperately longs to give you? It's not by sitting back and watching her husband serve her. It's by serving him back. It's by laying down her life and serving him. And here's how I know that's true, because John 3.16 says that God so loved the world, the entire world, that he gave his son so that who would, whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Christ gave his life for the whole world. And if gaining and keeping his joy was done simply by watching somebody serve you, the whole world would be full of joy. Christ has done his part. Is the world full of joy? Why not? Because, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) I guess he liked that one. (laughs) 
Christ has done his part, right? He served. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Christ did his part. If sustaining that joy, if gaining and keeping it was a matter of just watching and allowing somebody to serve you, we'd all be full of joy. The whole world would be full of joy, but it's clearly not. Why not? Because being served, being entertained, does not gain true joy. Christians, you are here to serve, not to be served. Church for you, John, is not about you. It's about him. Church for you is not about you. It's about him. We are not here to be served. You're supposed to come to, ser- to church to serve and in- to encourage, for you to encourage him and him, for you to encourage her and glorify him. Hebrews 10, 25 says, let us not neglect the meeting together as so many have done. But what does he say next? He doesn't say let us come together and be served. He says, let us not neglect the meeting together as so many have done, but encourage one another as we should. We're here to serve. So when I say God desperately loves you, amen? Amen. That's right. You, in service to him, remembering just how much God shows his love to you and having served you, you lift your voice and you say, amen. Amen. (laughs) Full of joy, full of his joy. You see, God wants to use you to lead more people to him and to encourage those who are already in him. God's not here to entertain you. Let's look at the scriptures again. Go back to John chapter 15. We're going to go up to verse 1 and go through this. Because I want to see if this is about us or about us serving others. Verse 1, he says, I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. It says he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't what? Produce or bear fruit. Not about me. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce more. Verse 3. He says, you have already been purified, pruned by the message that I have given you. You See, Christians, your part, he's done his part for you. You're saved. You've come to him. If you know the Lord tonight, if you have already received Christ into your heart, This isn't about you anymore. This for you, again, is about him. This for you is about him. We're here to serve. Let's keep reading. Go down to verse 5. He says, yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. And then in verse 8. He says, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings, my, brings great glory to my Father in heaven. This brings great glory. Producing much fruit, coming to church to serve, to encourage, to lead. This is what brings him great glory. Do you guys remember the two greatest commandments that Christ said? He said, love God and love your neighbor. Neither of those are yourself. But here's the cool part. Loving God and loving your neighbor is the greatest act of loving yourself because they gain you the joy of the Lord. So here's the good news. You don't have to focus on yourself anymore. God did his part with you. And he's going to continue working on you, but not by you focusing on you, by you focusing on others and on pouring into others. So you don't have to think about yourself anymore. But here's the bad news. You have to not think about yourself anymore. Right? But thank God for the Holy Spirit. Thank God that he gives us his Holy Spirit so that we don't have to trip up anymore, so that the enemy can't trick us anymore into walking through those doors and saying, boy, I hope I like the message tonight. I hope I like the music and I hope I like the coffee. I, 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 me, me, me. But God desires to give us the Holy Spirit so that we don't have to do that anymore. We don't have to fall for the enemy's tricks there anymore. 
You're not here to be entertained. You're here to serve. You're really hardly even here to be fed. I hear people talking about that all the time, about leaving a church because they're not fed this deep theology in church anymore. Christians, you're mature Christians now. You can feed yourself. The pastor doesn't have to do the choo-choo train or the airplane to feed you the word anymore. (laughs) We've graduated past that, guys. The pastor doesn't have to stand up here and entertain you. This 30-minute message that I'm about to give you it, it should be the smallest helping of food in comparison to what you're eating in his word all week. So small that you hardly even need this. If you're already a believer, you should be sitting here hoping to encourage the non-believers in the room by letting them see your joy as you're reminded, not first informed, of the truths in his word, because you've done your part. If you happen to learn something new in this 30-minute message, great. If not, you've got six days and 23 and a half hours the rest of the week to do your part. Christians should be the most serving and therefore joyful people on earth. Amen? Amen. We should be filled with the Lord's joy. But overall, Christians aren't. Why? It's because they're trying to find their joy the same way the rest of the world is. By putting everybody else's needs after my own, I'm going to get my own instead of serving. I'm going to be served. I'm going to be entertained. The church has just become another form of consumerism in America. You want real joy? Here's how. Lay down your life for your brother. Walk through those doors and say, it's not about me. How much have you been doing that lately? Now, when I ask that question, our tendency is to do one of three things. Because the enemy, he's not giving up. He's still going to try and trick us. Our tendency when I ask, how much have you been laying down your life for your brother lately? Our tendency is to, one, self-justify. Like, well, I've been busy. I've been getting my own. I've been working hard trying to provide for the family. Or we self-magnify. Like, dude, I hold doors for people all the time. I smile. I'm nice. We self-justify, we self-magnify, or we self-glorify. I'm the king of (laughs) self-sacrifice. Like, I'm the most humble person in the world. I, I put my, I put people before myself all the time. Hey, everybody, come see how humble I am. (laughs) Let me save you some time and some failure. Here's the true measure of, of just how good you are at sacrificing of yourself for others. The joy of the Lord. Is it in you? Is it truly in you? Are you filled with his joy? You see, the reason that we try to self-justify, self-magnify, or self-glorify is one of two reasons. Either we don't know the way to his joy, or we know of it, and we don't trust it. But I just told you the way, so now you know it. The question is, do you trust it? Do you trust his way to the joy of the Lord? The second I ask the question, how much have you been laying down your life for your brother? The enemy immediately attempts to trick you and says, dude, you're good. You you held the door for that guy the other day. It's only been a week since you really did something. You're good. Or he says, Dude, forget self-sacrifice. It's you. It's all about you. This is America, baby. (laughs) Get your own. The question is, whom do you trust? Are you still placing your hope in the route that the rest of the world has been tricked into believing? Or will you finally accept once and for all that God was right all along? It says that, I think it's in Hebrews 12 too, it says that Christ for the joy set before him chose to bear the cross. For the joy set before him was nailed to a cross. And Satan saying, no, dude, for the joy set before you, put everybody else last, put yourself first. It's all about you. No, lay down your life for your brother. You see, God 
was most glorified by self-sacrifice. Sending his son, his own son, for our salvation and then sanctification. Christ was most glorified by self-sacrifice. Laying down his own life for our salvation and then sanctification. You guys will be filled with the Lord's joy when you give of yourself for the salvation and then sanctification of those around you. Not a moment before. When, when that is the primary purpose for which you do everything in your life, you will be filled with the Lord's joy. Not a moment before. When that happens, you'll start to see things through a much different lens, different set of lenses. You won't come to church saying, oh, I hope I like the music. I, I hope I like the message and the coffee. You'll come saying, God, I, I, I desperately hope somebody gets saved tonight. Boy, I hope I can help encourage somebody who's struggling, even somebody who's already saved and just needs that encouragement in their life. Lord God, you've done such an awesome work in my life. Please use me tonight as your vessel to lead somebody, to encourage somebody. By the way, if your hope is in the music, the message, or the coffee, you're guaranteed to be disappointed eventually because the enemy has tricked you. Eventually, the band is going to play a song you don't like. Eventually, the message is going to sting and the coffee is going to get burned. Has anyone here had any one of those three disappointments? Raise your hand. Come on, be honest. How about all three of those disappointments? <laughs> exactly. Thank God church isn't about us. You see, you're not at risk of falling away from God because your church doesn't do everything your way. You're at risk of falling away from God if you actually believe your church is supposed to do everything your way. Answer me this, which person leaves church filled with the joy of the Lord? The person with their eyes on Christ and his glory, person A, or the person with their eyes on themselves and their own desires, person B? The enemy has tricked us. America's great weakness is pride. And the enemy knows it, and he has made the American church more about pride, entertainment, and what I get out of it than what it was always supposed to be about, Christ and drawing his children nearer to him. When we leave church, we shouldn't be saying, I liked the music, or I'm glad so many people came to see the show. We should be saying, you know what, I really think Christ was glorified in his church tonight. I'm so glad I was able to help. Now, using that exact word, I want to give you an acronym to use every time that you walk through those doors from now on. It's the acronym of the word HELP. So every time that you come through these doors from now on, I want you to think of this word, HELP. The first letter is H, and of course, that's HELP. How can I help somebody here tonight? How can I if it's setting up the, the stage or cleaning up or organizing the chairs or how can I help? How can I get my eyes off of me and actually help somebody here tonight? Then the next, encourage. How can I encourage somebody here tonight? You can be sure that in this room right now there is somebody that needs what God is doing in your life for encouragement. God is good. He desires to use you to encourage your Christian brothers and sisters and to lead those who have not yet received Christ into their life. How can I help? How can I encourage? And how can I love? How can I lay down my life for somebody and show love to somebody? And finally, produce. How can I produce fruit tonight? Every Saturday at 6 p.m. when you walk through those doors, I want that to be th what you're thinking. How can I help? How can I help encourage, love, and produce fruit tonight? If you do that, your eyes are not on yourself. You're not thinking about what you get out of it. Now, I want you to know that this isn't just something that I've learned by studying the word. Uh, as usual, <laughs> I've had to learn this the hard way. <laughs> 
We had to move 2,000 miles away and spend six months with essentially no one to serve in order to learn this lesson. You see, Jamie and I have kind of been on our own little island out there in, in Colorado because where we moved, we didn't know at the time, but it, it's about 40 miles from the church. So we're a good 50 minutes from the church, a church plant of about six people or so. So after all the, the time working and, and driving, there's not much time to be spent serving people. And beyond that, the church pretty much exists for about one hour a week. We come together on Sunday, we do our service, and then we go home, and that's it. So we haven't really had anybody to serve. And I'll be honest, we weren't really begging for somebody to serve before we left. Now we are. We've seen just how good you guys have it here by not having this. We've seen just how, much, how good we had it when we were here. But God has shown me these things while we've been away that what Satan intends for selfishness, God can use for good. Everybody here knows, including myself, that our, our real reason for going out there was a selfish desire to live in a cool place. Did I know it at the time? Deep down, yes. Was I willing to admit it? Of course not. <laughs> Do we regret it? Of course not. God has used the time to draw us nearer to him, nearer to each other, and to help us plant that church, which is awesome. God used the experience to show us that we can't do life alone. We must be in community, doing life together, helping each other grow. Time away to focus strictly on God is good. And we should have that daily. Each one of you should have your own time daily that you are spending with just you and God. But guess what? When you come out of that prayer closet, you have to come back to your community. Did you know that there are 59 commands in the New Testament in regards to doing life together? That if you're not doing life together, there's 59 commands in the New Testament that you are breaking just like in marriage, you should have your own relationship with Christ, but you ultimately have to come back together in order to truly glorify him. He intends to use the people around us in the process of sanctification. If the people around you drive you nuts, that's okay. And it's okay to walk away for a little bit, to take a, take a break, but you have to come back together to glorify him. You can't do it on your own. You're not meant to live on your own island. And here's the thing. God doesn't bring perfect people into our lives to make us happy. He brings imperfect people into our lives to make us holy, amen? amen. Can anybody attest to that one? God doesn't bring perfect things into your life to make you happy. How many people have a perfect car that is never going to break down, never going to rust, Moses for sure has one, right? God doesn't bring perfect people. He doesn't bring perfect things into your life to make you happy. He purposely brings imperfect people. He brings my wife, who couldn't be any more different from me, into my life. Not to make me happy, to make me holy. And guess what? When he makes me holy, I get the joy of the Lord. He's shown me that one church with a million dollars is far more powerful than a million churches with one dollar. The more that we divide the church, because I like my coffee at 106 degrees and he likes it at 104, or because I like the lights at 90% and he likes it at 80%, the more that we divide the church, the more we divide God's resources and the parts of the body. Guess what? If you sever my arm right now, I'm a little less useful to you. If you take individual parts off of this church and go start your own island over here, you've just weakened the church, not strengthened it. This is one of the biggest things that God has shown us. Now, I understand if you're going to Uganda where there isn't a single church, go plant a church out there. They need it. But look at this city block right here. How many are there, Moses? Like 15? And the more that we divide even our own church here, the more we weaken God's church. Come together. Get over it. 
deal with the crap you don't like. You don't like the music, you don't like the coffee, that's fine. It's not about you, we just established that. Deal with it. Come here to serve your brother, to lay down your life. If, if laying down your life means dealing with the song you don't like or dealing with a message that you don't like, you got 23 and a half hours the rest of the week or the rest of the day and six days the rest of the week to listen to songs you do like and to listen to messages you do like. We've got to stop the division in the church. Stronger together than separated. Together we conquer. Separated we are conquered. You can go live on your own island, but you're done. He's shown me that the coolest place on earth is nothing without community. You may find a church with nicer lighting, with songs that you like, and with better coffee. But if your focus is on those things, I guarantee that you will eventually be just as disappointed there as you were here. We found ourselves just as disappointed with the lack of community there as we were with the weather here. Is that really something worth leaving over? Is your little disagreement really something worth leaving over? He showed me this, make a decision and go for it. I spent so much of my life in the paralysis of analysis. God, the blue car or the red car? The blue car or the red car? The blue, if you say, okay, uh, he doesn't care. <laughs> if you are stewarding God's money well, that's what he cares about. He doesn't care. Make a decision and go for it. Francis Chan in his book talks about what if you were to say, you know what, we're adopting a kid because the Bible says to care for the widows and the orphans and we're on that track until he flat out says, nope, that's not what I meant. That's not what I wanted for you. What if we obey God's word to the extreme point until he stops us because it wasn't where he intended for us to be? Make a decision and go for it. God doesn't give step-by-step -step instructions. Would it require much faith if God said, okay, Take 10 steps forward, then make a right, go five steps, then make a left, go 10 more steps. How much faith does that require? You're reading an instruction manual. That's not faith. God gives gifts and abilities and desires. The rest is up to you. He doesn't care if you buy the blue car or the red car. He cares whether or not you're managing his money well. He doesn't care if you live in Colorado or Florida. His concern is whether or not you are serving him where you are. And finally, church isn't about you. It's about God. And going to a new church and our experience out there, especially one in which we really weren't in charge. We don't have much decision-making power out there. <laughs> We're so prone in our pride to judge the service and the new way that they do things out there. Like, I liked that song, but I really didn't like the message. The, the lighting is bad. The temperature is too cold. We should walk out, guys, saying, I really think this glorified Christ tonight. Amen. Guys, God desperately loves you, amen? Amen. amen? amen. God wants you to be filled with his joy. You do that, you gain his joy by serving, not by being served, by producing fruit, not by coming here and hoping to be entertained. You can do this only by remaining in his love, by receiving the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome your selfishness and to walk in him, to say, you know what? I'm here to help. I'm here to help, encourage, love, and produce. Let's pray. And I want to ask you to do something as we pray. I want to ask you to lift your hands. Get, to get out of your comfort zone so that your neighbor can just be encouraged by your love for this amazing, joyful, magnificent God. We get out of our comfort zone because it's not about us. Lord God, we come to you in prayer tonight asking for the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to overcome our selfishness Father, we may be just enveloped in a society of entertainment and me, 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 Lord, but you are bigger than that. Lord, you are greater than that. Come on, church. 
Lord God, you are holy, you are perfect. Your eyes were not on you for your glory, Lord. Your eyes were on us. Lord, you sent your son to die, Lord. Your word says you love the world so much that you gave. Lord, may we give of ourselves. May we produce fruit in your church, Lord, to bring you much glory as you deserve, Lord. Father, we know that you love us, that you desperately want us to be filled with your joy. Lord, help us to trust that the way to get there is in following your word, Lord. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Holy Spirit, come upon us. Just fill us so that we can overcome that selfishness, Lord. It's not about us. Lord God, we love you. We desire to serve you. And Lord, even as our shoulders are getting weak right now and getting tired, Lord, we, we trust in your strength, Lord, to lift them up. Lord, to encourage those around us. Father, you are good. You are holy. May we lay down our lives for you, Lord. We love you. We praise you. We gather in the name of Jesus for his glory, not for our own, Lord. Lord, be glorified in your church. Amen. Amen. Guys, we're going to baptize somebody tonight. Let's come to our feet right now and worship as we prepare to baptize somebody because God deserves to be worshiped as we prepare for that. So let's just lift our hearts, lift our hands and our voices and worship him tonight. My soul longs for you. My soul longs for you. Nothing else will do. Nothing else will do.
castle longs for you Nothing else will do Nothing else will do My soul longs for you My soul longs for you Nothing else will do Nothing else And I God is so good. Amen.